On May 13, 1912, the Oceanic was sailing to New York when she stumbled upon a collapsible lifeboat drifting in the open sea. They soon found that the small boat, Collapsible A, belonged to the RMS Titanic, already the greatest maritime mystery of all time, having vanished on her maiden voyage only a month before, with all of her passengers and crew presumed dead. This, of course, isn't what actually happened, but it was a more likely scenario than you might have thought. On April 13th, 1912, only one day before she hit the iceberg, the Titanic's Marconi wireless set stopped working. According to the rules at the time, wireless operators Jack Phillips and Harold Bride were not allowed to repair the equipment on their own. Instead, the instructions stated that they had to wait until the ship docked for the set to be properly serviced. Without an operational wireless set, the Titanic would have been on her own on that fateful night with no way to call for help or tell the world what happened. Without the Carpathia or any other ship speeding to their rescue, her lifeboats would have been left to drift on their own as the remaining survivors slowly succumbed to the elements, leaving no one alive to tell what happened that night. Titanic's story would have been lost forever. But instead of following instructions, Phillips and Bride took matters into their own hands. They spent most of the day repairing the equipment and finally got the wireless set back up and running only hours before every soul on board would need it the most. In the days before passenger liners were equipped with wireless technology, a voyage across the world's oceans was long and isolated. From the moment you left port to the moment you arrived at your destination, you were almost always on your own. If something went wrong, your chances of survival were slim. No one would know what happened to you as you simply vanished from the world. Here are the stories of four ocean liners that vanished without a trace. If you believe that renaming a ship is a bad omen, this one is for you. Originally built for the Cunard Line in 1865 by J.G. Thompson & Company in Glasgow, Scotland, the SS Java was a 2,696-ton iron-hulled steamship designed to carry cargo and passengers between Liverpool and New York. Soon after entering service, she quickly earned the nickname Jumping Java due to her erratic rolling in difficult weather. The ship was re-engineered with compound engines in 1877 and was briefly chartered to the Warren Line. One year later, she was sold to the Red Star Line and renamed SS Zeeland. A decade after that, in 1889, she was sold to French owners and renamed Electrique. By 1892, she moved on to her fourth name, the SS Lord Spencer, and passed back to British ownership, where she was converted to a fully rigged sailing ship. The Lord Spencer was going on 30 years of service when she left San Francisco for Cork on April 9, 1895. But when she failed to arrive at her destination, she was eventually declared missing. Her fate remained a mystery until November 1895, when her owners caught word of another disaster with a possible connection. On the night of July 14, 1895, around 350 miles from the coast of Brazil, A small cargo ship called the Prince Oscar was sailing through heavy swells. In a statement after the incident, Captain Henderson recalled that it was an excessively dark night. Just after 12.30, their lookout spotted a large vessel off their port bow, running without any lights. The unknown vessel abruptly changed course and flashed a red light before colliding with the Prince Oscar. The damage was considerable. The mystery ship sank almost instantly while the Prince Oscar soon followed. Her crew managed to launch two lifeboats, but the smaller one was quickly swamped. Six crew didn't make it off the ship or were lost in the smaller boat. The remaining 15 crew members survived in their small lifeboat for three days. They were near death when they were discovered and rescued by a ship called the Darwar. 
The incident happened so quickly that most of the Prince Oscar survivors didn't even catch a glimpse of the ship they collided with before she disappeared into the darkness. Some speculated that the mystery ship could have been another vessel called the Lord Downshire, which also disappeared around the same time. But later investigation suggested that the time and location of the incident made that connection unlikely. Survivor reports in the general location could potentially match the Lord Spencer. Her owner certainly thought so. But we'll likely never know what actually happened that night in the darkness. Today, the Lord Spencer is all but forgotten, and her fate will probably remain a mystery. The record for the fastest Atlantic crossing by a passenger carrying ocean liner is currently held by the SS United States. She won the Blue Ribbon in 1952, which happens to be just over 100 years since the last time a ship from the United States won the award. By the mid-1800s, competition for the Atlantic passenger trade was dominated by the British shipping lines. But in 1845, the United States Congress decided to fund an American rival through lucrative postal subsidies. The ambitious Edward Collins submitted a winning proposal for his company, the Collins Line, to build four modern steamships capable of maintaining a bi-weekly transatlantic service. These ships would be twice as large as Cunard's largest liners at the time. They would offer a host of new amenities, making them some of the most luxurious liners afloat at the time. And most importantly, their 12-knot maximum service speed would place them in line for the Blue Ribbon and offer a speedy and reliable mail service, upholding the almost unrealistic stipulations of their government contract. The first of these liners, the SS Atlantic, sailed her maiden voyage on April 27, 1850. She was by far the most successful of the four ships, which also included the Baltic, the Arctic, and the Pacific. The company was almost immediately plagued with financial and operational challenges. In a sense, they were victims of their own ambitions. But it soon became clear that their federal subsidy was also woefully inadequate to maintain the expectations of their contract. Their main rival, the Cunard Line, was far more established and enjoyed reliable support from the British government, with subsidies that doubled those of the Collins Line by 1852. To make matters worse, the struggling company was soon hit with tragedy. On September 27, 1854, the SS Arctic was traveling at full speed through a fog bank when she collided with a small French steamer called the Vesta. Of the 400 people on board, only 24 passengers and 61 crew survived. Every woman and child drowned, including Edward Collins' wife and two of his children, as well as other influential figures in the company. But a much more mysterious fate awaited the SS Pacific, which sailed her maiden voyage only one month after the Atlantic, on May 25, 1850. The Pacific was 2,707 tons, with a length of 281 feet or 85.6 meters and a beam of 45 feet or 13.7 meters. Her keel and hull was built with yellow pine, white oak, and chestnut. She was powered by two side lever steam engines and was equipped with three square rigged masts for auxiliary power. On September 21st, 1850, the Pacific claimed the Blue Ribbon, and for a few years she, like her three sisters, proved popular with passengers. On January 23rd, 1856, the Pacific left Liverpool for a routine voyage to New York. She was commanded by Captain Asa Eldridge. While this was only Eldridge's second voyage with the Pacific, he was an experienced and well-respected captain. On this voyage, the liner carried just 45 passengers and 141 crew, but this was typical for an off-season winter crossing. After departing Liverpool, the Pacific was never seen again. When she failed to arrive in New York, searches were sent in an attempt to locate her, but no trace of the missing vessel was ever found. These searches and other traffic in the same route noted that the ice had been particularly bad that year and many came to the conclusion that the Pacific likely hit an iceberg off Newfoundland. With half of their new fleet gone and facing mounting financial strain, the Collins Line suspended operations in 1858, selling the remaining liners in April of that year. As the company faded into memory, 
So too did the ill-fated Pacific. But then in 1861, a bottle with a message inside was found on the remote Hebrides Island in Scotland. The message read, on board the Pacific from Liverpool to New York, ship going down, confusion on board, icebergs around us on every side. I know I cannot escape. I write the cause of our loss that friends may not live in suspense. The finder will please get it published. W.M. Graham. It was discovered that there was indeed a British sea captain named William Graham on her passenger list. With that discovery, it seemed all but certain what happened. The Pacific, likely sailing at or near full speed in order to fulfill her unrealistic contract, collided with an iceberg and sank, not too different from the fate of the Titanic. It seems that the words of William Graham, if authentic, serve their intended purpose, shedding some light on what might have happened to the SS Pacific and those on board. While mostly forgotten today, the Inman Line was one of the three largest British passenger shipping companies in the second half of the 20th century, alongside the White Star and Cunard Line. In 1850, they launched their first steamer, the City of Glasgow, at the Todd and McGregor shipyard in Glasgow, Scotland. The company was one of the first to move away from wooden hold paddle steamers, and the innovative City of Glasgow was an iron hold single screw steamship. Her iron hull proved superior to wood and her single screw design opened up a considerable amount of space for passengers and cargo. The 1600-ton, 227.5-foot or 69.3-meter long liner could carry 137 cabin passengers with a crew of 70. She was later modified to carry an additional 400 steerage passengers. The city of Glasgow was designed for efficiency over speed and she was able to achieve 9.5 knots while only consuming 20 tons of coal per day. This became the blueprint of operation for future Inman liners and helped the company grow without the aid of government subsidies. She quickly proved a great success, and a sister ship, the city of Manchester, was quickly ordered, followed by a series of slightly larger new vessels, but 1854 proved a challenging year for the company. Their third liner, the city of Philadelphia, wrecked near Cape Race in September during her maiden voyage. While there was no loss of life, the liner was a total loss. Earlier that year, the city of Glasgow met a much stranger fate. She departed Liverpool on March 1st, 1854, with 480 people on board, including 111 cabin passengers, 293 steerage passengers, and 76 crew. She was commanded by Captain K. Morrison, while he was an experienced navigator and had served as chief officer on the ship for many months, this was his first voyage as captain. The ship was due in Philadelphia on March 25th, but the liner never arrived and no trace of her was ever found. Sailing the same route a week later, her sister ship, the city of Manchester, reported an unusually large number of icebergs during her journey. At first, her owners believed that she had simply been delayed by an ice flow but by the end of May, she was accepted as lost. Soon after her loss was reported, a number of contradictory and some downright impossible sightings were reported all over the Atlantic. At the end of October 1854, the bow section of a ship bearing the name City of Glasgow washed ashore near Campbelltown in Scotland. But in a strange coincidence, it's more likely that this belonged to a smaller vessel with the same name that was presumed lost in a storm in the area earlier that month. With almost nothing to go on, what happened to the city of Glasgow, an innovative and influential liner, will probably never be known. The city of Glasgow wasn't the Inman Line's only liner to disappear without a trace. After their early setbacks, the company soon returned to building innovative and successful liners. In 1857, following the collapse of the Collins Line, Inman picked up their United States postal contract, and by the 1860s, the company was growing rapidly, soon building liners that rivaled the speed records held by Cunard. 
On November 1864, they launched the city of Boston, again at the Todd and McGregor shipyard in Glasgow. She came in at 2,213 tons, with a length of 305 feet or 93 meters, and a beam of 39 feet or 12 meters. Her two steam engines powered a single screw that could achieve a very respectable 12 knot service speed. On January 28, 1870, the city of Boston left Halifax, bound for Liverpool as part of her regular New York Halifax Liverpool route. She was commanded by Captain Halcrow and carried 55 cabin passengers, 52 steerage passengers, and a crew of 84, though some sources say she had a few more people on board. As you can probably guess by this point in the video, the city of Boston never arrived in Liverpool. For weeks after her scheduled arrival, it was hoped that she just suffered an engine failure and would soon be discovered by another vessel. This was, after all, the early days of steam power, and breakdowns and delays were common. But as the weeks turned to months, it became clear that something terrible happened. Many suspected that she got stuck in a violent snowstorm that hit the area two days after she departed Halifax, and perhaps collided with an iceberg. It was also reported that she might have been overloaded, making her less capable of handling rough weather. The incident received a considerable amount of attention, and a number of other theories were floated. A series of bottle messages were discovered in the following months. One claimed that the city of Boston collided with another vessel. Another reported that a fire broke out, crippling her engines. The signatures on both these messages didn't match anyone known to be on board. For some reason, fake bottle message hoaxes seemed to be all the rage back then. But another message, discovered in Princess Bay in Staten Island, New York, seemed the most credible. Dated March 2nd, this one reported that an engine room fire had overtaken the ship driving everyone to the bow, and she was swamped as the crew attempted to launch lifeboats. The letter was signed by someone with the name James, with the last name that ended with the letters NAS. The rest of the name was illegible. There was a steerage passenger on board named James McManus. While the message could be authentic, the listed date would mean that the fire happened 35 days after the city of Boston left Halifax, more than double the duration of her scheduled voyage. It is notable that two separate bottle messages reported a similar fire, but with it being impossible to verify the authenticity of these reports, they fail to provide any clear answers. The fate of the city of Boston will probably never be known. The tragedy was one of many that plagued the Inman line, as they vied for a place in the competitive transatlantic market. While they enjoyed a few decades of success, and even claimed the Blue Ribbon with the city of Paris in 1889 and the city of New York in 1892, by the end of the 19th century, challenges mounted, and the company was folded into the American line in 1893. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to hear the story of an ocean liner that disappeared in the 20th century, check out my video on the SS Waratah, linked down below. If you enjoyed the video, help out this channel with a like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done that already. As always, I'd like to give a special shout out to my supporters on Patreon. They're the guiding light that keeps me on course. Alright crew, that's all I've got. Until the next one, be nice to people.